Okay, Isaiah chapter 57. Uh, <clears throat> the righteous man perishes and no one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. They rest in their beds. What's uh, Isaiah talking about here? He's talking about the souls of the righteous, okay? Uh, he's talking about wisdom chapter 3. You often hear at funeral masses, let's go back and refresh ourselves, wisdom chapter 3, we've all heard, but the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God. No torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be an affliction. And they're going forth from us to be their destruction, but they are at peace. For though in the sight of men they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. So anyway, I won't read the rest of that, but we're familiar with that. Uh, that is the sense of Isaiah 57, 1 and 2 here. The righteous man perishes and no one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace and they rest on their beds. What a beautiful perspective on death. Um, that can console our hearts, those of us who've suffered loss of a loved one. The words of scripture, that's why people choose that reading from Isaiah, or excuse me, from Wisdom chapter 3 so often, because it's so deeply consoling. Uh, that's just not the way the world thinks of death. It's the ultimate evil to be avoided at all costs and prolonged and not to be thought of. Uh, but for those of us who believe and whose hope is full of immortality, look, the righteous man is being taken away from calamity. Would we really want to live down here forever? Really? Is that what we want, immortality down here? I mean, really, it's a blessing and a curse. Look at the elves in Middle Earth. Okay, in Tolkien's Middle Earth, the Lord of the Rings, you have this firstborn race of beings, <clears throat> these elves, who are blessed with immortality. But really, it's a blessing and a curse because uh, they have to live down here and their hearts are restless. I mean, they're they're just sad. Sadness is kind of the bitter brew um, uh, of the elves in a certain sense. They're, they grieve. There's a certain grief to the heart of the elves, a certain sadness uh, that they have to deal with. Um, it might seem great. Hey, let's live forever down here. But for men in Middle Earth uh, who had to die and face their mortality, uh, this was actually, when you go back and read the Silmarillion, I think is where this is found, uh, or maybe it's in the Lord of the Rings. I'm not sure where but I want to say in the Silmarillion that it was always conceived of as a hidden blessing for men that they would die and that they wouldn't be faced with immortality down here in this calamitous situation of sin, death, and the devil. Is that what we want? Uh, to just continue living on and on and on and on. Uh, down here. You get world weary after a while when you get kind of cynical and hardened by life and you know um, death is a release uh, from this affliction down here. Yes, I mean it's, it's a sad thing uh, but with a Christian attitude about it uh, we see beyond to the ultimate reality and to the life on the other side uh, that God blessed us in the beginning when he kicked us out of that garden and he shortened our lifespan. In a certain sense, it was a blessing that we don't have to, you know, we'll sin less. The longer we're down here, the more we sin. It just, uh, 
You know, we think of it as this terrible thing, but it actually was God's mercy that uh, we only live for a shorter, a short time. Now, um, moving on, uh, there's just um, a tremendous rebuke here in chapter 57 of the Israelites, of the Jews who return and fall into the same old, same old. Boy, it's just a story of salvation. It's just same old thing. They're going to burn with lust among the oaks and under every green tree. And they're going to slay their children and offer them as sacrifices to this God Molech. And then they're going to burn incense and uh, or, you know, use perfume and oil to try to cover up the stink. Okay of um, in our own time, you think of the sexual revolution and uh, the abortion on demand that kind of you know, came in the wake of the sexual revolution or came along with it, the death and destruction of children, the fruit of these, uh, of unions of fornication and so on. Um, yeah, we don't sacrifice our children to the God Molech, but in a certain sense, we're doing exactly what's being described here in chapter 57. We have uncovered our beds, made them wide, and um, burned with lust under among the oaks and under every green tree. It's pagan idolatry in a certain sense, even though if it isn't explicit or, you know, and consciously willed as such. Uh, really, in essence, that's what we're doing. It's substantially the same in our own time. Uh, the uh, and and ultimately, an offense against God and leads to death. Among the smooth stones of the valley is your portion. Really, that's an indication of an improper, you know, a uh, not a proper burial is what's uh, being evoked there. Um, now, there's hope. Tremendous hope in chapter 57 here. You've loved their bed. You have looked on nakedness. You journey to Molech. You sent your envoys far off and sent down even to Sheol. Now, listen to this. You were wearied with the length of your way. You know, you're on the way to... On the highway to hell. Um, I won't sing that ACDC song for you right now. You are wearied with the length of your way. Headed down to Sheol. On the highway to hell. But you did not say it is hopeless. You did not say it is hopeless. Even though you're weary. You're weary. It's wearisome. This life, this pursuit of uh, uh, godlessness, wickedness, uh, leaves us restless. You know, we just never really can satisfy ourselves. Uh, the wicked are like the tossing sea at the end of the chapter. That's what we're going to hear. It cannot rest. There's no rest. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. <coughs> The wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot rest. Or Jeremiah says it really well too, Jeremiah 2.13. You have rejected me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for yourselves, <clears throat> broken cisterns that can hold no water. And you're just going to... Go like the Samaritan woman back and forth to that well to one husband after another, after another, after another. And now the guy you're living with isn't even your husband. Here's the bridegroom of the human race encountering her saying, look, if you get drink of the water that I can give you, it will spring up within you. A fountain of living water will spring up within you that it will satisfy that restlessness in your heart. All right, so look, you got to hit rock bottom. And I think there's a lot we can learn about any type of addiction here. Because, uh, you know, in, in this case, we're 
you know, it's, it's fornication or adultery, but uh, ultimately this wickedness applies to anything, anything that we place before God, any creature that we put in place of God um, is a form of idolatry. And all of these uh, addictions that afflict us, the human race, uh, are ultimately reducible to this for a form of idolatry and they just torment us and we are wearied by them uh and we're they're taking us down to Sheol and you were wearied with the length of your way just um increasingly uh a loss of return on our investment we as with any addiction, you build up this tolerance and you need more of the drug or of whatever it is of the activity. You need more of it. More, 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 more. You can never have enough and <clears throat> never satisfied. But you did not say it is hopeless. You were wearied from the journey, but you did not say it is hopeless. That's what I want to stop and pause on for a second because I think... There's some real uh, crossover insights here into Alcoholics Anonymous, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is a little book here, but it's really the first portion of the big book entitled Alcoholics Anonymous, written by the founders of that program that has changed so many hopeless lives. People who admitted they were hopeless. That's the first step of any of these 12-step programs, to admit that you're powerless, okay? That you have no hope. Until you reach that point and say, it is hopeless, uh, you're just going to continue on this path to hell, to shale, to death, okay? You did not say it is hopeless, you found new life for your strength, and so you were not faint. So, you know, it's like the, the saying goes, you, you got to hit rock bottom. You got to hit rock bottom with these things. Sometimes people are hard-headed. Not in every case. Sometimes people pull back from an addiction. They see an addictive pattern taking form in their life, and they pull back from it. But often is the case with people, they have to hit rock bottom their wife or their husband leaves them or uh, they lose their job or they wreck their car. They get thrown in prison or they get told by their doctor, if you don't stop this, you're going to die. Uh, something jars them, jolts them. Their life becomes completely unbearable uh, and, uh, and they, they reach this point of hopelessness. Now, I want to read from uh, Alcoholics Anonymous here because there's some brilliant insights in here about addiction. And here's Bill. Bill Wilson is one of the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, in his story at the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous, the book, the big book, on page 11 here, it says... Uh, he encounters... He, he's basically at his wit's end with alcohol. And he, uh, he receives a visit from a friend, another alcoholic, who has found recovery. And this alcoholic uh, comes to him, comes into his house, sits down in his kitchen and starts giving him his testimony. Basically kind of witnessing to him, 12-stepping uh, him, uh, you know, uh, reaching out to another alcoholic and telling his story, showing him a pathway to hope. And a solution to his problem in finding a higher power, finding God uh, who can solve this problem for us. My friend sat before me and he made the point blank declaration that God had done for him what he could not do for himself. His human will had failed and he was ready to admit that to himself, to God, to other people. I am hopeless. I am a hopeless cause. I am powerless over this substance, whatever it might be. In this case, alcohol. He made this point declaration. God rescued him. Okay. And uh, from a hopeless situation. Um, now, Bill looks at this guy, Bill Wilson, and he sees there's something different about this guy. 
I saw that my friend was much more than inwardly reorganized, okay? This wasn't just some human endeavor, some self-improvement, self-help program. He read, um, no, no. Bill says he was on a different footing. His roots had grasped a new soil. He had found a spiritual solution to his problem of alcohol. Um, now, Bill says, I finally placed myself unreservedly under God's care and direction. I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing and without him I was lost. I have not had a drink since. Unbelievable. Uh, let's hear some more. If you like that, let's jump to pa uh, page 25 here and hear about hopelessness. There is a solution. In the chapter of the book entitled, There is a Solution. Uh, but we saw that it really worked in others and had come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. Okay, they had come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as they had been living it. Um, now, uh, how about one more here? How about uh, 48? In that respect, I love, I love this. In this respect, alcohol was a great persuader. It finally beat us into a state of reasonableness. Sometimes this was a tedious process. We hope no one else will be as prejudiced for as long of time as some of us were. Okay, uh, A great persuader. So any of these ways that we choose of idolatry, basically... Isaiah is saying the same thing in chapter 57 here. We go down those paths, we pursue those things, and try to fill that cistern. We're just going to keep going back to it again. We're going to be thirstier and thirstier. It's going to become this wearisome, long journey, spiraling down to death, ultimately. To Sheol. Um, and we got to reach this point where we say and admit to ourselves and to God and to others, it is hopeless. It is hopeless. If we refuse to do that, we're just going to keep going, keep going, keep going. But uh, the beautiful, beautiful thing here is it's in God's paternal ingenuity. He allows these things to afflict us and weary us. You know, they, uh, they come with a certain price tag, all these addictions. And there's just tremendous suffering. The, uh, uh, the Basically, the side effects are terrible and destructive. Uh, anytime we try uh, any of these shortcut solutions to finding peace in this life or finding happiness in this life, apart from God and his ways, uh, we just cause tremendous suffering for ourselves and other people. And alcohol is a great persuader. They finally beat us into submission. Beat us into a state of reasonableness. That's the hinge of an addiction, an, addi an addict's recovery hinges on this state of reasonableness where they admit the hopelessness and futility of their situation, of their addiction, and they turn... To God. Now let's move on here. Verse 11. Whom did you dread and fear so that you lied and did not remember me? Not me, but God. Uh, God speaking here to the wicked, for to those who are idolatrous, okay, to addicts, I would maintain. Whom did you dread and fear so that you lied and did not remember me? Did not give me a thought? Have I not held my peace even for a long time? And so you did not fear me. God like tolerates this behavior. He's long suffering. Uh, waiting for us to reach this watershed moment. Uh, he, he lets us spiral down and make these choices like the prodigal son until we come to ourselves, come to our senses. Like the prodigal son who's ready to just fill his belly with the husks that the pigs were feeding on. 
Okay, God is willing to let us take our inheritance and, and splurge and just uh, in riotous living. Go ahead. Go out there. Have at it. If you want to do that, go ahead. But you're going to suffer the consequences of it. You're going to be left hungry and empty and lonely and everything else. And hopefully that is going to bring you to your senses. So... Let's go back over this verse 11, which is so powerful here. Ha whom did you dread and fear? Whom did you dread and fear so that you lied and did not remember me no, nor give me a thought? Fear is a huge aspect of overcoming addiction, rooting out fear from our lives. Alcoholics Anonymous and 12-step programs, they know that. Uh, fear is something that absolutely has to be removed from our life as much as possible. And Isaiah gets this. Um, the whole of the scriptures is about trying to remove fear from our life. Be not afraid. Remember that? Saying of St. John Paul II, simply what our Lord often said, what you hear throughout the scriptures, God continuously telling us and angels telling us, and don't be afraid, be not afraid. Don't be afraid of what the world's afraid of. Isaiah said that back in chapter 8. Let's look at that real quick because that's really good. Um, God says, do not fear what they fear, people in the world. Don't fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall regard as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread in a certain sense. You know, um, what does he mean there? Basically, not that we're to be cowering in fear from God in some kind of servile sense, but that we treasure this covenant so much. We keep this covenant and we protect and guard it, this intimacy, this fellowship we have with God as his children. And we want to do things that are pleasing to him. We don't want anything to disrupt this covenantal relationship that we have with Almighty God. Uh, out of love for God, uh, that fear or dread is really the dread or fear of sin, of anything that would come between us and God that would create a separation uh, between us and God. We're going to hear about that when we get to chapter 59, how sin causes this separation. And um, so back to the fear. Whom did you dread and fear? Don't fear what the world fears. Don't fear run and run around and be anxious about what you will wear. Our Lord says this kind of thing. Look at the bird, you know, look at the lilies, look at the birds. All right. Look, God, your heavenly Father knows what you need. Don't run around and be anxious what you wear, what you eat and so on. The world runs after those things and is fearful about those things. Um don't be fearful of these things in the same way that the world is. That's a worldly attitude that we got to root out of our lives. And let's turn to alcohol, the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And look at this incredible wisdom here. The 12-step uh, programs, they know we got to get rid of anger and fear out of our lives. Because they're the two chief offenders that drive us um, away from God, destroy and undermine our spiritual lives. All of us, fear and anger, resentment and anxiety. These two things just are corrosive uh, to our spiritual life. And we have to continuously fight against them. All right. So it was fear was an evil and corroding thread. The big book says the fabric of our existence was shot through with it. But we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We asked ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? In other words, look, look here. Whom did you dread and fear so that you lied and did not remember me, nor give me a thought? I mean, that's a description of self-reliance. Uh, self-reliance failed. We asked ourselves why we had all these fears. 
Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Because we had forgotten God. We haven't given him a thought. We haven't made him our refuge and shelter. Um, so perhaps there is a better way. We think so, for we are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role he assigns. Just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely upon him, does he enable us to match calamity with serenity. Now, um, let's look at the second half of verse 11 here. Uh, have I not held my peace even for a long time, and so you do not fear me? It's like that long suffering. Let's talk about that. Okay. God's, you know, it took a while for the prodigal son to reach that, to get to that place of desolation that brought him to his senses. It's like God allows us to go through a process sometimes patiently. And who knows how long it's going to take. Some people, you know, uh, whatever it could it just can't compare ourselves to other people but look um, the Lord's letting this happen to us for a reason if you have somebody who's going down the wrong path keep praying for him and let that prayer let that grace build up like water behind a dam and just build up pressure in their life because God's waiting and waiting and waiting for that critical mass that moment of that threshold that 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 hinge moment in their life this tipping point where they're going to get to this place where they're going to become reasonable uh, we never know when that's going to be we just have to patiently hang in there and keep piling on the prayers just let it build let it build let it build like saint augustine and his his mother monica just kept praying for him and it just built up like water behind a dam until the dam burst in that garden he describes in the confessions where he finally accepts uh, book eight chapter 11 and 12 where he accepts faith and becomes a christian okay um now what was i gonna look at oh yeah 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 let's look at second peter 3 8 through nine and peter basically says the same thing do not ignore this one fact beloved that with the lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day the lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness but is forbearing towards you long suffering not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance. Okay. It's an it's curiously, counterintuitively, it is God's mercy that He allows some people to go on and on, uh, you know, in some backsliding addictive behavior. Uh, he's letting them go through this process, and he's waiting, waiting, waiting for the moment. Uh, to unleash grace and you can have some of the most amazing turnarounds there's always a possibility of a miracle uh, in, of grace in somebody's life so we should never give up hope and just have the patience of the lord here god is patient one day is as a thousand years he's forbearing towards us not wishing that any should perish that all should reach repentance. Now let's look at Paul in Romans chapter 2. And he warns and cautions, and this kind of kind of is a counterpoint that, uh, you know, in case we think, oh, okay, well, God's patient. I must have a thousand years to run after all these things. And uh, I'll just keep on spiraling down. St. Paul's like, careful, don't presume. Don't be fall into the sin of presumption. The error, erroneous thinking of presumption. Do you presume upon the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Don't presume on that. Do you not know that God's kindness 
is meant to lead you to repentance. So let's get on with the business of repentance, of conversion. And don't uh, think, oh, I can procrastinate my uh, rejection of sin in my life, my turning away from sin, repenting from it. Uh, I'll just tolerate this and uh, for a while longer. For he will render, okay, but by your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. For he will render to every man according to his work. We're going to come back to that in uh, one of the uh, chapters here. I don't know if it's this. I think it's coming up. We're going to hear. We're going to come back. You're going to hear that again. Romans chapter 2. Uh, he renders to every man according to his work. I think that's actually uh, going to be chapter 59, another installment. Uh, but we're going to hear that uh, passage again. But look, uh, God is patient and merciful with us to a point. We cannot presume upon his mercy to our own destruction, you know, because we'll be storing up wrath for ourselves. I will tell you of your righteousness and your doings, but they will not help you. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. God just says, look. You think this is going to save you? It's not going to save you. All right. Whatever it is, your idol, our idols, whatever they might be, our sins, our vices, our addictions, all forms of idolatry. Let your idols save you in the day. They're not. They're a mirage in the desert. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you the wind will carry them off a breath will take them away when we get to the other side it's like the famous uh, you know you hear that uh, image of the monkey you know you can trap a monkey by just putting a coconut or something like that or whatever putting some bait inside of a, a cage with a hole uh, that enables the monkey to reach in and lay hold of whatever it is. Uh, but they can't get their hand and whatever the bait is out uh, through the hole. It won't pass through the hole. So apparently you can actually trap a monkey by doing this. And they will sit there desperately trying to get that thing out of the hole and you can just walk up and throw a net over them or put a rope around them uh, because uh, all they have to do is let go of that thing and run off and they would be rescued or delivered um, I don't know how that fits in here but just this idea the wind will carry them off a breath will take them away they're nothing and less than nothing vanity of vanities there's nothing there vanus Remember where we get the word vanity, nothingness. There's nothing there. Ultimately, it can save or deliver us. We are doomed to be like the tossing of the sea. We cannot rest. All right, now, uh, buddy, let's hear something hopeful. You ready for something hopeful and consoling? Let's shift gears back to hope and consolation. But he who takes refuge in me, the Lord says, shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain, Eden, the Garden of Eden. If we take refuge in the Lord, how much better is the Lord than these idols? There's no comparison. Where would we rather be holding on to this stupid idol or addiction? which is destroying us and undermining us. Would we rather have that or God's holy mountain? So there's a certain enlightened self-interest, a positive argument here that God uses through Isaiah. And God is continuously appealing to us, look, this is for your own good. Look, I am your healer. Uh, look, what I'm giving you is so vastly superior 
uh, to anything the world offers. He who takes refuge in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. Take refuge in me. And that's exactly what people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I love Bill here. He describes his story. He says, uh, it's like being rocketed into a fourth dimension um, is how he describes the experience of finding relief, a solution to his problem. It's like he was rocketed into a fourth dimension. I love that image. Uh, that is somebody who just feels uh, just the incredible euphoria almost um, of somebody who has been to the edge uh, and been pulled back. And I love it. Rocketed into a fourth dimension that is so superior. The life, the richness, the blessings of those who turn away from substance abuse of all kinds or any type of addiction, God compensates, man, what he gives us is this fountain of living water that springs up inside of us that is truly restful and gives us the joy and delight in his presence and leads us to his holy mountain. It's so vastly superior. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. We got to be convicted by this argument God's making with us. And let go of our sins. Let go of them. And choose God and his ways. And it shall be said, build up, build up. Prepare the way. Remove every obstruction from my people's way. Sounds like the beginning here. I mean, sounds like back in chapter 40. This description of the ministry of St. John the Baptist. To prepare the way of the Lord. Uh, these words that are always accompanying uh, the ministry of St. John the Baptist, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God, chapter 40. This comfort that God gives, and um, and he wants us to smooth out uh, this and create, you know, fill in the valleys and um, the uneven ground shall become level. Every mountain and hill will be made low. Um, prepare, build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way to this holy mountain that he wants to lead us to. Paradise, eternal blessedness, sharing the inner life of the blessed Trinity forever. Rest for our hearts to become fully alive and reach our fullest potential as God's creatures made in his image and likeness. That's our destiny. The insanity that we don't run, run towards this destiny. Instead, we cling to these things, to our sins. So build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way, every impediment to the grace of God in our life. We got to remove and uproot. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. And also with him who is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. For I'm not going to contend forever. I will not always be angry. His anger serves a purpose. His wrath serves a purpose. It's, a, it's, it, it's, it's all an aspect of God's mercy, of his love, because that's what he is. That's all he is. But it's a tough love. And he's desperate to win us back. Sometimes he lets us experience the pain and suffering of our choices. But there, it's ultimately uh, motivated by his love. For from, from me proceeds the spirit, and I have made the breath of life, this high and lofty one who dwells in eternity. Remember, that was the description of God, the high and lofty. Dwelt in this high and lofty place back in Isaiah chapter 6. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. High and lifted up. 
Um, <clears throat> God was high and lifted up. High and lifted up, sitting upon his throne. That's the very same description of Isaiah uses in chapter 6 when he has the original vision of the Lord. Thus says the high and lofty one. Look, I'm looking for somebody who's contrite and humble. I'm waiting there for us to make our move. You know, his grace is just poised for us there to just take his grace and turn back to him. It's constantly wooing our heart um, and drawing us towards life. This spirit, this breath of life from me proceeds the spirit. I have made the breath of life. I am your healer. Listen to this. Because of the iniquity of his covetous, covetousness, I was angry. I smote him. I hid my face and was angry. That's just an aspect of God's love. Bear that in mind. But he went on backsliding in the way of his own heart. Backsliding, backsliding, backsliding. Even though I smote him in my anger. And it was just another way of saying, look, I just let him experience the consequences of his sinful actions. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. Listen to that note of hope in Isaiah 57. Even though he's backsliding, backsliding, there's always hope. He's waiting. He wants to heal us. Oh, boy, he loves us so much. I have seen his ways, this backslider, this addict, groveling in his addiction. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and requite him with comfort. Peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. Now, this can be interpreted different ways. I mean, St. Paul quotes this verse here, peace, peace to the far and to the near. And he likens it to the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews being the near, the Gentiles being the far. Peace, you know, and this dividing wall separating them has been removed. So that's kind of how Paul interprets it. Uh, yeah, and um, St. Paul's a lot smarter than me, but uh, I like to think of this in the context of um, sin here and immorality, the moral life and the spiritual life that we've been hearing about. I hear far and near, I think of, you know, look, somebody who's really wandered far from God in his ways and somebody's closer, somebody who's near. Okay, peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. And lastly, the wicked are like the tossing sea, cannot rest, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. No peace for the wicked. I think um, that gets us to the end of chapter 57. We'll hit chapter 58 next time. God bless you.